So welcome everybody. And it is, as I said, it, a great pleasure to see so many people here, many people that I myself already know and many new faces, so welcome to everybody. And both myself and Helen Jones, uh, as the trustees of SPA, are really pleased to see that there's so much interest in what we're doing and what we hope to do in the future. Um, Helen will talk a little bit more about the actual plans and the development a bit later on, so I'm not going to steal her thunder. Um, but simply to welcome everybody. Nice to see so many different faces. And also, we're very lucky this evening to have uh, a wide range of speakers from uh, different professions, different organisations. And we're going to start off with a, a kind of question and answer session with uh, our two very special guests here at the front. So if I could ask uh, Lem yes. and uh, Becky to come to the stage. And I'd last, uh, ask everybody to give an applause for Lem to say. Um, directly over to us. So I think I've been asked to start by saying a little bit about myself. I'm Professor Becky Francis, Director of the UCL Institute of Education. Yeah. And I was asked to um, begin by talking about how I came to issues about social disadvantage in education. Um, so just a couple of words about me at the outset. And I suppose that, you know, we're all shaped by our context, aren't we? Um, I attended secondary school in the mid-1980s, way back when, and um, was really, um, I suppose, uh, very starkly impacted by the fact that of my own group of friends at my, you know, very working class comprehensive, um, I was the only one uh, to get the necessary qualifications to proceed with my education and go on to higher education. And that wasn't about ability within my circle of friends. Um, and I was really aware of that. I was also um, a young feminist and spent uh, many days at Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp where oh. my sister ended up living for a while um, when we were sort of just leaving school age. Um, and I suppose that these... these um, feelings of dissatisfaction and anger about uh, issues and social inequality were given a kind of um, concrete conceptual foundation by my sociology A level. I went on to study English as an undergraduate and um, was very fortunate to um, be offered a scholarship at what was then London Met. Uh, it, well, what was then University of North London, actually, now London yeah. Metropolitan, where they welcomed, you know, my political interests as well as my uh, literary critical turn uh, in, in terms of sort of addressing um, social interests in education. And I suppose the rest is history in terms of my career. Ever since, I've been researching issues in social inequality within schooling and the way that schools can both tackle educational inequality and challenge it, but of course, as we all are aware, sadly also reinforce and reproduce that inequality. And over the years, I've been looking at gender, ethnicity, social class, and so on, and getting more and more involved in policy making. And some of you will know about my uh, policy work. I'm a pragmatist. I think that we need to be influencing policy as much as possible, and as well as making small improvements, also work to militate against uh, negative policies going forward, while trying to hold on to utopian agendas in our, in our daily work as well. So I suppose that's my background. Um, I'm really proud and privileged to be um, appointed director at the IOE, where, of course, delivering social justice has been one of its key educational missions, and, of course, to have brilliant research centres like the Thomas Coram Research Unit that, again, have had um, improving equity as the heart of their work. But 
enough about me without no. further, no, <laughs> <Actually. laughs> without further ado we're absolutely privileged Len to have you with us here today and I'd really like to start by asking you how you got interested in questions about education and social disadvantage I guess my my uh interest in uh, in education and social disadvantage um, began when I was in the children's homes in that uh, in that um, in that I became very aware that the people who worked around me and for my well-being and the well-being of the other children in care um, were more concerned with with the upholding of the institution than they were allowed to be concerned about us so so they were actually not allowed to do what their instinct wanted to uh, uh, that th th want wanted to do which was help us directly to have direct contact and what was that about institutions are built through great creative uh, force for good um, it's very it seems to be the form of things that they very quickly turn into uh, um, places which must run well. Uh, and, and, and running well has very little to do with the child at the centre of it. And I remember feeling that viscerally, uh, that, 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 that I was cancelled out by my existence. And I remember feeling that at the time and knowing that I could not communicate that to the people who were there to either listen to me or hear me. And, and, that's, that's a and you that at the time. Yeah, that, and, and that's, I mean, insightful of you, but a fascinating insight for all of us, I think, um, as professionals. <laughs> It almost inevitably educators come to their roles don't they with a social mission yes. you know that's yeah. mainly why we do it yeah. and yet the nature of our institutions yeah. can turn out to make our work so problematic I mean when I think of the broader picture in relation of sort of the the, the exam factory discourse yeah. um, this c can be the result of these institutional drivers incredible and, and I think artists have always been able to see into the future so if you look at Pete Seeger's little boxes which is actually written by a woman but then it was Pete Seeger that made it uh, uh, that, 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 that took it um, and if you look at Pink Floyd's uh, another brick in the wall and you hear that last line from another brick in the wall where where the teacher is shouting or where the where the where the adult uh, the, the, the the person with the res uh, a certain amount of responsibility is shouting if you if you don't eat your if you don't eat your meat, you won't be able to get your pudding, you know. And then if you link that directly to um, a, a young uh, poet called Sully Brakes, who has just done an incredible video that, that, I, that my friend Nick, Nick uh, showed me, which is about, uh, I understand education, but I haven't passed my exams, and which analyzes his mother's reaction, a child's mother's reaction to the child who isn't doing well at school, yeah. and the mother not being, uh, not not understanding that her child is probably the most intelligent person in the school and yet is not passing exams. It's a beautiful uh, thing that this, this kid has done. Um, artists have often been able to find the, the place which is missing within the institutions that are supposed to be serving the, the child, you know. Um, I'm, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That's, I, I very much want to come back to the point about the role of art in a second, actually. Can but I just say one thing? Yeah, please. It's that this is not, I'm, I've, ever since then to now, this is not a them and us situation. And, um, and then maybe it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is, this is it's, it's so easy to, for people to set themselves in the, in, the institutions tend to enjoy a fight because they understand the rules. I remember in, in the children's homes that, that I, 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 I saw when all of the staff knew how to be when something went wrong. Right. The, and, and in the assessment centres, I was put in an assessment centre which is like a, a PRU now mm. I guess but it's, it's a darker thing because it's, it's less defined. Um, the, there was a sort of, I, I saw the thrill in certain staff members 
when something went wrong because they knew what to do. There were signs all over the children's homes uh, that were red boxes that said in emergency break the glass. We were all um, children in the emotional Hiroshima of not having family. Nobody thanked us for not on a regularly, regular basis not breaking the glass. Mm. But when we broke the glass there was a full set of rules. You know the first thing that I was told when I went into the care system uh, and it's important you know to not forget because a lot of us as children we grow into adults and we have children ourselves and we then decide that that's a part of our life that we cannot speak about. This societal mm. idea of shame is one of the things that feeds the institution, the workers in it, and the people who live next door to the children's home, forgetting that these are children. The point that I was trying to say is that, is that when the glass was broken, everybody knew, oh yeah, that was it. One of the things that was said by many social workers was, um, was uh, I can't be emotionally involved in my work, obviously. Yeah. Because if I was emotionally involved in my work, um, I mean, you, how would you spread the emotion between all of these right. different people? That was the most ev emotionally violent statement that I had to be a part of as a child. Mm. That yeah. was emotional violence from the get-go. From the get-go of walking into the care system, I was not hugged. And a hug is the mm. first thing that I wanted. And if you couldn't physically hug me, I wanted you to acknowledge that me not having a hug would have a long-term effect on a 12-year-old boy. Once that was not acknowledged, I knew I was in an unsafe place. Mm. In being in an unsafe place, I realised that everything that I did would form a reaction against a system which had to close me down. So within 12 years, of, of within five years, of, I'm, I'm railroading now, no, sorry. It's awesome. But, but I, you know, I know what pedagogy is, and, and, and I know that you'll be getting this, you know. So, uh, and uh, Professor Petri, I, you know, Petri, by the way, is what people say when they want to make poetry sound very posh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sad. I've actually just, I've just saved that joke. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, but, but the, you know, everything that I'm speaking about is what pedagogy is, is social pedagogy is about filling that gap and about le allowing those workers to take responsibility. Yes. You know, um, but can I go on a bit? Yes. <laughs> Because we are fighting a prejudice, I mean, I said, you know, it's, we are fighting a prejudice which actually goes a long way back to the beginning of the social services and to the idea of what a child in care is, to idea of what charity is. So, uh, charity is towards the child and it's written, uh, Charles Dickens saw it, you know, the artists, you know, they're not to be taken lightly, mm. you know. Uh, Philip Pullman, uh, and, and, and uh, if, if I've said this before, but it's true, Harry Potter was a foster child. Lyra Balakwa mm. from Philip Pullman's Northern Lights was a foster child. Uh, James and the Giant Peach, Cinderella was kinship fostered by her sisters. Um, um, uh, Oliver Twist, um, uh, 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 Elizabeth Salander, the girl with the dragon tattoo. James Bond was a foster child. You know, Superman, Spider-Man, how is it, how is it, you know, it sounds funny, but actually, how is it that our society, what prejudice has got between our society and those workers in those children's homes being able to say to a child, do you know what all of the classics, Romulus and Remus, you know, the, the Greek myths, you know, they're, they're, they're full of kids who are from backgrounds like yours. You know, yeah. how is it that those links could not be made? Yeah. It has to be an inherent prejudice in the system. And, yeah. Well, I think that... Let's so, see how sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. getting in there now. <laughs> <laughs> I think that <laughs> does resonate strongly with social pedagogy. And um, Lem and I have already had an amusing exchange where we both admitted ourselves novices in social pedagogy. <laughs> yeah. So we're learning as we yes. go along. And that's been a, a, a wonderful aspect of yes, this event. Yes, it really has. Um, it's really exciting. I've learnt that social pedagogy is often seen as sort of education in its widest sense yes. um, because one learns through uh, common interaction with other people. Um, can you speak about that in your experience? Well, um, 
what is it, heart, hands and what? <laughs> Come on, what is it, heart, hands and head, thank you, yeah. Because what there was in the care system when I was there was, was there was a lot of head and not a lot of that. You know, this is all of, this, all of this Jimmy Savile stuff and all of the, all of this, all of this stuff is all a result of a lack of pedagogical, that's, I know that's wrong, but... The reflection. Uh, and, uh, approach. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's being washed out, you know, it's being rinsed and... Uh, uh, in our society, and what will replace it? What needs to replace it? I don't know whether I'm answering your question. I don't think I am. Could you no, ask me I again? No, I think, I think it's... So the question was about um, learning from what are often deemed to be common experiences, and actually I suppose that a lot of your uh, narrative about your past speaks to this. Yeah. But also, as I understand it, social pedagogy is very much about mutual respect, that that's the absolute sort of starting point for learning. Closing the gap, right? Right. Between the, uh, you know, what would be in different circles called the consumer and the, uh, the customer and the provider. Or the hierarchy, right. I suppose. Yeah. 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 I don't even like those terms, even though I know they've got to be used in certain situations, I guess. Actually, I have no idea why. You know, one of the things that I loved about uh, listening to you, Professor, speak was, um, was it tangentially links, uh, was the taking away of abbreviations. An LAC is a looked after child. Mm. And the moment you get somebody who works with LACs, they start to say LAC. Yeah. More interestingly, the moment you get somebody who works in the lobby group, uh, um, uh, the lobby group area mm. uh, towards changing uh, practice, uh, they also yeah. use those, those terms, which always made me feel mm. that they had been recruited to simply mirror the system that they were supposed to be mm. uh, changing that's a long story but when you start to think that a campaign for young children in care to get them to stop having suitcases and start having uh, so stop having bin bags and start having suitcases when they're going from one home to another when any organization who's a lobbyist thinks of that as a success I think we've got a problem in other words that's not, that's, by, that's a million miles away. This is where deep massage change happens, um, which should and could very well bring you on to Camilla Batmangela at some point, because some of those processes were very much along the lines of this. And this actually works, it works counter to the institutions that I was speaking about. Right. It, it does, you know, it, it, it is, this is a, this is a powerful move, a powerful system of behaviours mm. to counter a behaviour, an institutionalised behaviour, which has become rigid and lost. Yeah. I think the uh, room for reflection I was really impressed yeah. by, because um, sometimes for all of us actually to have some space to reflect on what we get caught up cyclically in yeah. our daily lives um, can just be incredibly powerful and important, can't it? Um, yeah. I, I, you know, having read your, your biography and your trajectory, you sort of think if, if surely if some of those people had stopped to think a little about the young person's perspective, um, in a way that social pedagogy enc encourages. Yes. Surely there could have been a time out called or questions. They didn't have the opportunity for reflection. Mm. And I, 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 there is a point that I'm looking for that I wrote down about reflection. Uh, it was the opportunity to look at three, three different points. And I can't find it. And I wrote it down and... I will just, sl oh, there it is, the professional, the personal, and the private. <laughs> the professional, the personal, and the private. And to be able to reflect on the, your, 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 as a worker, yeah. you know, yourself professionally, yourself personally, and yourself privately in your engagements with whomever um, is a gift to a worker, right? And is, is, um, is uh, it w also means that you will get the best from the yeah. person who's working yeah. for you, you know, economically it seems like it makes sense. Right. And you mentioned... I want the people who work with us to be emotionally, you know, to at least 
have some emotional language to communicate to the young people that they're working with. Mm. As soon as you say that they can't have that, as soon as they feel, um, you know, the thing that I had a lot when I was in care was, it's them up there. So I would ask questions further and further because I wanted some, you know, love is an action. It, it, you know, it, it's an action. We often think, people often think it's, you know, it's something that I didn't know I had a child and I didn't know I had so much love inside me. Well, you did. You did. You had it all the time. You just got an opportunity for it to blow your freaking mind. <laughs> and you had a child and that happened. And exactly the same love happens between uh, an adopted mother and father and their child. Mm they allow that to happen they break down that that you know that that fourth wall that personal fourth wall it's a beautiful thing um i've i've sort of lost myself but i, I think that yeah i have yeah <laughs> <laughs> well um one of the things that i wanted to come back to you've already um made allusions to literature and um also poetry yeah. um what do you feel is the role of creativity and the arts in education? Ooh, well, I, there is, you know, I would ask Nick uh, Corston to, uh, to anybody to watch any of his videos for a, a, a company called Steam Co, who are just incredible. Um, um, uh, people will speak of great business leaders as being creative in their thinking and in their processes and in their problem solving. Um, it's not a light. It's not a light. Uh, it's not a light compliment in my, you know. I think there's been a prejudice against the idea of creativity, as if it is something which is. Um, well, I don't know actually because I don't live in that world. But we're born creative. We're born creative problem solvers as babies, and we look to teaching. We look to the adults to give us the right or the wrong directions. But we learn ourselves. Or we learn between us. <laughs> And, sure. um, in communities of practice, I believe, yeah. is there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is, that, is, is there a thing? <laughs> <laughs> Great. And, um, and um, I think uh, uh, there is something about the creative. Uh, and by the way, creativity is not the monopoly of artists. You know, this is one thing that people uh, do to, sure. to, 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 um, to, to, to silo um, subjects. Yes. <laughs> you know, because creativity is, is inherent in all people. And many subjects, we think about Abs maths and so on as well, but you're absolutely right, that tends to be an assumption about what we're talking about. Yeah, maths is not um, beautiful. Math can't be beautiful until you've got to that nirvana, the beauty sure? nirvana, which you don't know about at school, you know what I mean, because it's not, it's not supposed to be beautiful. You know, science as well, and actually, you know, the more, uh, the more the public grasp an idea of a subject, the more beautiful they start to see it to be and the more creative they start mm. to think of it as, without realising that actually <coughs> those subjects have, been, have, have had big walls put in, in front of them, uh, between them, I should say. And you were talking um, in your own, when you were thinking about your own situation, about the power of, um, again, literature, poetry, to resonate and stimulate, um, you know, is that something that you... Yeah, no, it's a very powerful... Uh, po my poems became like my family uh, in that they, they, um, they, 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 they allowed me to understand myself and the world around me at a given s space, in a given space and time. And, I mean, I've, you know, all family is is a group of disputed arguments between one group of people over a lifetime. All family is is a, um, uh, um, is a set of uh, yeah memory. It's like each family member has got a has got a video of the same event, and they're all in the editing suite <laughs> arguing about about the documentary that's going to be made. And and um, I realised that I had nobody to argue about the the, the documentary of me. And nobody, yeah, I realised when I was in care that nobody I knew at 18 years of age, that nobody I knew knew me for longer than a year. And I realised that only I knew that that's got to be bad. All anybody else would say to me was, oh, Lem, you, you know, you just got to make friends, friends of the family that you never had. But you could say that because 
families where you make friends first. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. I did not have that. Uh, so, uh, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, did it fall? And if nobody sees it, and, and, no, and so poetry was a way of me being able to go, I, I was here now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, 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 and uh, I can't tell you how, how, how important that was to me. And, uh, um, and any time I've been in a newspaper as a, as a, in my 20s, it was proof that I was somewhere. That's it, because all family is is a group of people proving that each other exists over a lifetime. And they don't, want, they don't ever want a child to think that they don't exist. So even if a parent... And by the way, nobody said that parents should be good. This is the thing that bugs me about children's homes. People are, oh, the parents are terrible. Really? No, no nobody actually, there's, there's nobody said that's not what procreation was about. It wasn't like, you will procreate and you will have, be a nice parent. That's not actually what the deal was. It was that you just, just having the, ch the next generation is, um, blah. Well, you know what I'm coming to, blah. don't you? <laughs> having I'm heard about the poem. <laughs> I mean, I think we would all be absolutely honoured if you would read us a poem, please. I'd love to read you a poem, Thank and because you. it's Valentine's Day, and because, because uh, on the 14th, and because um, it's gone, hasn't it? Yeah. It's gone, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone, I tell you. But uh, this poem gets read at a wedding, like, once every month, somewhere in the world. And uh, for me, the fact that that happens, coming from a, a person who, you know, who's not had family. By the way, I've found my family now all over the world and I've got a fully dysfunctional family just like everybody else. And I'm not sure what was better. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's a big, that's a big thing to realise. Um, <sighs> Half of them are not talking to me because I exist. Um, because we all carry our story. We're all from somewhere, from some event, some moment, some time. And families like to know. They're like, I know you, this and that's that. But I arrive and I'm like, no, I'm the oldest brother. <laughs> I mean, I didn't say that, but actually, <laughs> apparently that's what I thought I was. <sighs> <laughs> anyway, this, uh, this poem's called Invisible Kisses, and um, when I started reading when I was about 20, 21, I started my first double page in The Guardian was at 21. Um, I, I was reading poetry like this, and now I read like this. Yeah, <laughs> you, you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> um, Invisible Kisses. And the reason that we said this, we spoke about it down there, and the reason I said is that, that, that in not having, in the people who are kept on the outside of the systems that are supposed to be the inside, actually have, a, you know, allow themselves to have a really great view of it. You know? and I, I think actually the people inside the systems have the opportunity for that as well, but it's just that it does not afford them the possibility to mm. be able to do that. And so it's, yeah. Uh, anyway, Invisible Kisses. If there was ever one whom when you are sleeping, who would wipe your tears when in dreams you were weeping, who would offer you time when others demand, and whose love lay more infinite than grains of sand. If there was ever one to whom you could cry, who would gather each tear and blow it dry, who would offer help on the mountains of time, and who would stop to let each sunset soothe your shades of mind. If there was ever one to whom, when you run, who will push back the clouds so that you're bathed in sun, who would open arms if you would fall, show you everything if you lost it all. If there was ever one whom, when you achieve, was there before the dream and even then believed, who would clear the air when it's full of loss, count love before cost, if there was ever one whom, when you are cold, will summon warm air for your heart to hold, who would make peace in pouring pain and make laughter fall in falling rain. If there was ever one who can offer you this and more, who in keyless rooms can see open doors, who in open doors can see open fields and in open fields see 
harvests yield. Then see only my face in the reflection of these tides, through the clear water, beyond the river's side. All I can send is love, and all that this is, a poem and a necklace of invisible kisses. Thank you, thanks a lot. But you see how much that, that you know, we were saying about um, pedagogy and social pedagogy being and relatively new in its blah, but it also goes back such a long way to the point that, you know, I was 25 when I wrote that poem, that I can see it in there. You know, when you achieve was there before the dream and even then believed, you know. That's all we're asking for, I think. You know, it's the all... Yeah. It, it, it. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, in terms of documenting your life, yeah. this is sort of incredibly visceral and moving, of yeah, course. Was, yeah. um, I read the children's home before coming yes. here, and that's almost the sort of other side of the coin, isn't it? You know, this is a sort of the, the cry of the child. Yeah. Um, the children's home is the, I mean, I felt clenched that's after it, reading though, isn't it? That's this. Yeah, poem. That, that's what, what for, for young people in the care system today, what has changed and what stays the same? Uh, wow. Wow. Because um, if I was to change this room by moving these paintings around, has this room changed? And it, it sort of has. There'll be all kinds of reasons for those paintings being there that historically will be relevant. Maybe it's the way the sun comes up. Maybe there's a, there'll be a pattern as to why these are here and it will have great relevance to this institution. And to move them would be a great thing to do. You may have to actually contact the ancestors uh, who are living to find out whether that painting can be moved to that side of the room. Um, and that's a big deal for this place. Is it a big deal for this event? You know, or actually, life makes, outside. <laughs> but you know, it, but it makes me emotional yeah. thinking that you know, yeah. because actually, you know, the, I've watched the change since leaving care. I was, you know, the moment I left the care system, I was asked to be a role model, which actually hurt me so much that 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 the insight that somebody could have into my time in care was that I should go back in and tell it how it has not served me so it could serve others. I find that also an emotionally violent situation to put a child in children's councils. However, and if any of you know what children's councils are, you'll know what I've just said. It's not our job to feed back to the system as to how the system is. You know, I want the care system to use uh, its heart, its head, and its hands to look after the child in care. Mm. And when I'm looking at changes in the care system, uh, the, the wholesale drawing out of foster care more due to financial needs rather than the actual needs of the child, who is to say that children's homes are a bad thing? Of course, the lobby which is parents and adults, will always say it's a terrible thing because they're the ones who are, will tell us that family is the nirvana for any child. It is not necessarily and never was necessarily for the child in need. What does a child need who runs away from their parents or who's thrown away or abused by the parents? Do they really need, first and foremost, to go into a familial situation of strangers that they haven't met before, albeit that they have been introduced rightfully in, uh, in the way which uh, suits the um, fostering uh, institution. Is that the right place for a child? Is it what is so bad about children's homes? Because we've had bad practice in children's homes. Mm. We've done them badly. It's not that they were bad, it's mm. that our systems were bad. So when speaking of change, what are the parameters? Are we moving the, you know, yes. the, the and we, we need to ask those questions, you know, we need to, look at the motivations for 
for example, foster care. By the way, I think that fostering and adoption is the greatest thing that a human being can do. I really do. There is nothing that will test a human being more than adoption because your own child tests you more than you've ever been tested. And the same thing happens in adoption. It is the greatest thing. It happened. Moses did it. I mean, the parent, Moses was an adopted child. You know, Jesus was from a two-parent family, you know, two fathers. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> you better be writing some of this down, you know, because that gold... <laughs> Gold, uh, Mohammed, peace be upon him. You know he he was brought up by his grandparents. You know so um, so I'm not against fostering, but I do think that we should always question the motivations for the wholesale um, nature of it, especially as things are hard to track in fostering. Bad practice is much harder mm, to track, mm, it's much easier to track in the care yeah, in the children's, yeah. which means that the, the care system could actually be much better in children's homes. Anyway. And how do we make the children's homes a, a home for children? So when a kid comes into care, child comes into care, it should be, you know, I'm, you know my bar's up here, okay? If we don't get there, that's fine. But if, if I can allow my bar to be there, um, you know, it should be, it stops here. Everything you get is the best services. We understand that you're probably going to break a window or two or try to break a person or two <laughs> because you're broken. Mm. So you can do that and we're still going to be mm. here. But that's not what happens. Mm. That is just... Still, you think? Yeah, you know, the, the, the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even if it did happen for 99% of the uh, children, which I know that that's not the case, but uh, I would still be concerned about the 1%. Yeah, yeah. Because I think that's really important, because that's how we get better. Of course. It's not... I'm not about... You know, I had to spend years trying to not convince people <coughs> that, that my voice was authentically feeding back and was not trying to beat up on people. Mm. And I, f I re remember how easy it was to not listen to a voice that you feel is both trying to find a solution and they're equally incredibly hurt. I really want to get more into this, but <laughs> I, I, I feel like almost, um, you know, that, that we, I'm fascinated by some of the things that you've said about um, what I'm reading almost as a sort of responsibilization of you um, and your role to feed back, and yet why you, why won't others take responsibility? And yet almost, um, again, you've cited the literature, almost the inevitability that somebody like you will be held up as a role model yeah. and a star for those kids. But I'm really aware oh, I've just I'm had so the sign. Sorry, <laughs> we might have to carry on over a drink. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, 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 I've had the sign and I want yeah. to draw in two last questions, if it's OK. Yeah. Um, first of all, Obviously, um, your mother came to the UK from Ethiopia. Um, you're, you are an advocate for young people. What do you make of the dubs withdrawal and the situation for child migrants um, from France, for example? Uh, that's a big question. Um, tell me what dubs is. So this was the arrangement that the government... There's somebody out there who won't know what Dubs is. <laughs> OK, yes. yes. Uh, this was the arrangement that the government had um, to bring, uh, to, uh, to, to bring uh, young children un under a certain age, 17, was I, am I right, um, over from the jungle in Calais. And they... And then they have rescinded, they've gone back on that. Uh, yeah, no, that's really uh, sad. Um, sorry, there's, there's... I think at the moment there's something like 4,000... Uh, children, they will go straight into the care system, straight into yeah. you know the children's services. Yeah. There's, I think, 4,000. Uh, March 2016 was the last uh, count. Yeah, so, uh, it was, was 4,000 then. Maybe it's more now. Uh, that are asylum seekers, children mm. in children's services. Boom! Good bit of research, Len. Thank you for doing that. Good bit of research, Len. I'm just Len. thinking about myself writing all these, these notes down. <laughs> Very good. Thought. But um, sorry, that was a little bit immature. I apologize. <laughs> uh, but. <laughs> Um, it's sad that they've gone back on it, but um, it also makes me, uh, sorry to say this, but think that they feel ill-equipped. So I'm not speaking for the government, but I, what is worse to bring somebody in a system that's not actually set up to be able to work for them? Because because when they're 18 and they go into adult services, 
and this, this is going to have bad care for them is going to have a knock-on effect. However, they said that they could come here because they thought that they could give them good care. So, um, Well, yeah, I suppose the point. question remains about where they are, doesn't it, and where yeah. they remain. Um, and also some questions about agency, I suppose. And, and you know, these are profound questions for all of us, I suppose, about what we can facilitate, what we have the resources for, uh, um, and what we should. Sorry for interrupting, but I just think, to answer the question, I just mm. think that they should have taken them. Um, period. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a great <laughs> fan of borders, to be honest, yeah. personally. I just think that everybody should be able to, sorry to say this, but I think that everybody should be able to live everywhere whenever they want. <coughs> okay. And a last question, bringing it back to social pedagogy. Um, how do you think that children's home staff and foster carers should be educated? Um, I think... Um, in, in social pedagogy terms, um, there was a great example that was given, which was that, God, this is beautiful, a foster parent um, was, um, you'll know this, uh, Professor, but um, a foster parent was, because it came from you, a foster parent was um, encouraged to do other things with the young boy. I'm guessing it was a boy, actually, maybe it wasn't, but... Uh, and so the foster father and the young person uh, were fixing his bike, his motorbike, and there was an incredible sense of closeness between them, or contact between them. Is that, that's right, isn't it? That was the example. Yeah. And and I just I just remember the int I'm going to make this personal again, but I just remember the intense binary between my foster parents and me, who set mm -hmm. they'd set it up but they'd set up this impossible situation, which meant that the motorbike mending would never get done, the car polishing would never be, you know, th there, was, there was no, and social pedagogy looks to the value of activities which are not seemingly yes. directly about the solution that they eventually get to. A perfect example, and I think, a perfect way to finish. Uh, we could go on, no, I, you know. It. I'm really honoured to be I, here for the launch as well. I know that everyone's really enjoyed it, so please do. So next we are going to be uh, inviting our speakers to talk about the impact that social pedagogy has had um, on them and their organisation. So I would like to welcome uh, Nicola Boyce, who's a social pedagogy trainer with St Christopher's Fellowship, uh, Robert Kogleck, who's the head of corporate parenting at Hackney, yeah, get that right, make sure I get it right, and Nick Corker, who's the head of the virtual school for looked after children also at the London Borough of Hackney. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nicola Boyce. I work for a charity called St Christopher's and we run a range of children and young people's services in England and on the Isle of Man. And we had a slightly long and circuitous journey to get to social pedagogy. So years ago, we were part of the national pilot under the then Labour government. We had a couple of social pedagogues in one of our children's homes, and we didn't quite see a real significant impact or go away with a sense in the organisation that we understood truly what social pedagogy was about. 
but we had understood enough to be interested and curious and to go and do a couple of research visits to various different services in Norway and in Germany and begin to try and understand what value there might be in this idea for us. And I think that's important because it is that getting away from the institutional or systems-based notion that there can be one set of right answers or models for what young people need and particularly what young people in the care system need. So we came around over a period of time and thinking and talking to two years ago deciding that we had got to a place where we wanted to invest in social pedagogy training for all of our staff. We made a partnership with FEMPRA, who've been so crucial behind helping to create this momentum that has resulted in the Social Pedagogy Professional Association, along with others. And so two years ago, we began with introductory training courses of just nine days for staff, but also very short one and two day training courses even for our staff who don't do direct work with children, so that the whole organisation was part of making a shift towards working in a more social pedagogic way. And I say a shift towards because this is work in progress, not completed. And social pedagogy is about that, a different philosophy and lens for thinking about what is it that we are doing when we are practising relationally with other people to enable them to achieve their potential to allow all of the, the genius and creativity in them to unfold through the time that we spend together, whether that's mending a motorbike or whether that's just making dinner together, as every day is that, but how we create those learning opportunities. So I'm here to talk a little bit about the impact, and that's an impossibly difficult question to answer, particularly when I'm sitting in the room with... Uh, Professor Cameron and Professor Petrie, who have done so much work on trying to wrangle with this question uh, in research terms. How do we evaluate the impact of social pedagogy? Because the answer is a very pedagogic one. It's one that an awful lot of pedagogues in Claire and Pat's research came up with when given really concrete vignettes about what would you do in practice if? And one of the most common responses was, well, it depends. And the outcome of social pedagogy depends because what's the service? Who are the young people? What are your aims? What are the values? What are you there for? So our answers just in one charity differ. So in one of our homes for young people between 16 and 25, they would say, well, in the last year, we've seen over a 20% reduction in serious incidents involving young people of all kinds. And that that's been directly related to part of how we've used social pedagogy is focusing on a weekly group reflective practice session which has completely transformed the way we think about and adapt and how creative we are in our practice with young people. In another one of our regions, we would say a number of our homes have seen an over 25% reduction in children going missing. We have fostering services where that would be much less of an issue, it would be a less meaningful figure and social pedagogically part of where the system needs to have that more sophisticated understanding is what are the changes we're trying to make and therefore what numbers are meaningful to us in measuring that um, because it does depend what kind of impact we're looking for. So for me some of what has been the most compelling uh, information about what effect has it had has been what young people have said to us and what young people have said to us uh, across our services is that they feel like we understand them better than we did before. They feel like the staff listen to them more and allow them more freedom and trust, are more willing to be flexible and creative in the way they go about things with them. And one, one particularly lovely statistic that came back from our most recent survey of young people in our services uh, was uh, a real pleasure to me to see. The first thing I need to clarify is when I say survey, uh, we do some very good participation work with young people and they've been very clear with us that they are surveyed out, they are done with questionnaires and they don't want to be asked what, what, wants, what, we want, what they want to change in how they're looked after. They want to have a conversation with a human being. So when I say survey, the methods used very social pedagogically included trampolining, graffiti workshops, poetry writing, cleaning out guinea pigs, and indeed just doing some washing up together. Uh, so a whole gamut. We had over 80% of our young people get involved in that survey, and one of the things that they told us 
was that over 91% of them said that they trusted the staff who look after them. That's massive. We're talking about young people who've experienced trauma and abuse and neglect and an awful lot of moves in the care system between an awful lot of placements and have so few reasons to trust any adult and some of whom have not even been with us for very long. Over 91% of them trusted us and we asked questions with the other ones about well, what does it makes you feel you're not able to trust us so that we could understand rather than just take the numbers and run. And what they said to us is really beautifully encapsulated by one young person where I actually brought exactly what they said because I wanted to get the words specifically right. This young person said, I don't really trust anyone. Trust is a strong word. I know that the staff will do everything in my best interest though. They want it to be right for me. I trust them to do that. This is a young person having a conversation about the fact that for them, trust in relationship is a massive issue. They've actually been learning a lot about themselves and how they are in relationships that's important for a good life. Everybody in the room knows that. And so that kind of not trusting, that still to me is a measure of, well, we're getting somewhere if you trust us to do the right thing for you, if you trust us that much. And one young person tried to encapsulate a change that she'd noticed in the year, first year that people in her team had been learning about social pedagogy and trying to apply it in their practice. Um, and this is what this young person said. She said that I didn't trust the staff before. It's much different now. I'm not sure what's the difference. They seem to understand much more my thoughts. They're giving me more of a chance to open up by doing things with me like cooking or activities rather than bombarding me with questions about me and why I do things. Before, when I didn't trust staff as much, they didn't understand that all young people are different. Different things happened to us. And so there are different ways of going about things with each of us. What's right for one person won't be for the others. I trust that they're going to do the things that are right for me now. That's an enormous shift. Because for that young person, the feeling that what's going to happen for them is going to be what's right for them tells me that we have made a shift away in culture across our services from the idea of an institution where the most important thing is what Lem was describing about the smooth running of the institution. And so the answers aren't simple in terms of what's the impact. They're messy, they're complicated. In, in some places it involves children having pets in homes that they weren't allowed to have pets in before. It can be simple, small things. In others, much more daring things. Um, like, for example, Alongside the introduction of social pedagogy for my charity, we've also been using uh, funding from the Department for Education's Innovation Programme to create two new children's homes specifically for young people who've been involved in sexual exploitation. And part of what those homes have the power to do is use locks to keep children home and safe when they're on the point of running away to meet up with perpetrators of sexual exploitation that they're already connected to. And that feels like one of those wisdom of Solomon dilemmas for a practitioner. In social pedagogic terms, we want them to learn and grow and feel empowered and safe in the relationship. And in week one, when you come into that home as a young person who's been abused and exploited with a bunch of strange adults who have the power to lock you in, we can be replicating exactly the dynamics of an abusive relationship. Some of our measures of success have been that the average length of time that that restriction of locking the door has ever been used for in one of those homes is 30 minutes or less. It's all it takes to slow things down enough to have a conversation to change what that young person's going to do. And so we are delighted at St Christopher's at the launch of the Social Pedagogy Professional Association because Lem's point is well made that it's not just practice with individual children and individual carers that needs some change, but also we do have a system that needs change and recognises that success can be what doesn't happen. And sometimes success is things like the young person who came back to one of those homes saying, I have been out and I did meet up with the guy who you know has been harmful to me before, but I told him 
that even though I would go with him to this place, I wasn't going to do what he wanted me to, and I didn't have to. That's right, isn't it? She said to the workers who'd been looking after her. Progress is not that she was home on time. Home on time would be lovely. That could come later. Her growth is in recognising that she deserves to be loved and to be safe and also to have the power to choose for herself where she goes and who she sees and how she's treated. That's a transformation. And having a system that can understand that and the creativity and flexibility that goes with it, that would be a transformation of the wider society and culture around those young people. And I know that certainly for us, that's a huge part of the ambition of what we hope we can achieve together with everybody else who is behind the development of social pedagogy. Good evening. Um, there's no pressure here for me tonight because uh, Lem is talking in Hackney tomorrow to our looked after children. So if I get this wrong, I might have an empty stage. Um, so I'm Nick Hawker. Um, I'm the head of the virtual school for looked after children, care leavers and youth justice. And it's my role um, in Hackney to ensure that, that our looked after children and care leavers achieve the best that they can possibly can, that they possibly can do. I was first introduced to social pedagogy eight years ago when a gentleman from Germany came and introduced it to the Looked After Children's management team. Um, as you might imagine, after a 30-minute conversation, I was left with more questions than an answers. In fact, it was quite foreign, literally. Um, fast forward eight years, I have a team of four social pedagogues and, I'm pro and employ probably the only social pedagogic manager managing social pedagogues in the whole of the country. Um, so what's in it for me? Um, while social pedagogy is a European discipline it's, and still has to find its mainstream foothold in the UK, the values and ethos uh, behind so social pedagogy are not new. They're not alien and indeed they're not even foreign. Um, I've been a teacher in this country long enough to remember a time when our education system um, was not all about data dashboards, value-added progress charts, and teaching our children to practice speed, speed reading so that they could get through the key stage two reading test. God forbid they actually stop and think about what they're reading. Um, there was a time, post-millennium, when the nar narrative around education was emotional literacy where we were all encouraged to have emotional literate schools, um, where circle time was part of the curriculum, and relationship, relationships and feelings were all part of the educational experience. I don't look, up, look back on those days with rose-tinted spectacles. We did truly have some dreadful schools. But I do believe we've lost something um, of great value in our educational system if we throw away those ideas um, in our current drive for the best results. I was heartened to read yesterday that there was a drive to put relationships back in the national curriculum, so that's, that's great. Um, so this brings me to social pedagogy. My virtual school is quite different uh, from many virtual schools around the con country. From the outset, I did not want members of staff sitting in endless meetings to discuss children's progress, their behaviour, or indeed the latest um, school uniform infringement. While it is, of course, at times necess necessary for us to attend those sorts of meetings, I firmly hold on to the view and the belief that if we want to change children's lives and to make a difference, then we actually have to get to know them and work with them. Um, so in designing the structure of the virtual school, I did, deliberately did not employ advisory teachers, which seems to be the model for most virtual schools. I employed a staff group that actually work with young children, uh, children and young people, and support them through their difficulties, um, take, them on, take them on activities, and ensure that everyone around the child is pulling in the same direction. Um, I don't have time here to tell you all about the different roles I have in the virtual school, but I would say that social pedagogic principles have been a strong influence on the design and purpose of what we do. So the two questions I would like to try and answer here. Firstly, how has social pedagogic theory and pract 
practice influence the work we do? And secondly, what has been the impact uh, of adopting this type of approach? And remember, it's 2017, and educational speak all revolves around impact. So, so how has it influenced what we do? I would say that most importantly, it has given me and the team a theoretical base and a language system on which to explain the things we do and the way that we do them. I won't say that it's changed my ethos to working with children, that's always been there. It has changed how I've managed the team uh, and, the and, and the way that we plan the work that we do with them. Educational systems, as you know, are very hierarchical. Um, and I've tried to address this using social pedagogic principles to have a much more collegiate approach. For example, the team takes turns in chairing meetings, um, of drawing up agenda items, and taking part in group reflection. I have to say, I'm still getting used to me to talking about my own feelings in staff meetings. Um, it's this, but if this type of approach does nothing else, it certainly makes for a happier team. Um, but I also think that it has had far more. Re uh, far-reaching effects. Uh, social pedagogy has given us a license to do, to do activities with schools that may ordinarily, they may ordinarily be wary of. Um, we have been able to complete observations of children in class, not only to suggest certain approaches to the school, but also to work with the, work with the child and support them to make the changes they need to make. That's the difference between sitting in a meeting to talk about behaviour and working with the child to help them change their own behaviour. Um, okay. Uh, we've also been able to run social groups in schools with our children and other, and, and other non-looked-after children that we work with through, through difficulties in friendships groups. That's the difference between sitting in meetings and discussing about children who can't get on with each other and working with the children and their, their relationships. And they're, they're two pretty simple examples. Um, so if I move on to the second question I pose, what have been the outcomes of adopting this type of approach? So you will un you'll understand that it's not easy to take a specific discipline and, and prove a specific outcome. Social pedagogy doesn't really work like that. However, I can say that Hackney's looked after children achieved the best GCSEs in the country in 2015, and we're still waiting for the results for 2016 to be released, which was almost three times the national average, and a really remarkable achievement. And if you are a care leaver in Hackney, you're much more likely to be employed in educational training than almost anywhere else in the country. But as I said earlier, it's not all about exam results. Our children and young people are very likely to have experienced something else other than what the care system usually offers. Trips to the theatre, creative arts, poetry workshops, a weekend in Paris at Christmas to see go to the Louvre, and a week in Kent are all activities that have taken place in the last two months. Only last week, which was half term, uh, we carried out a range of activities that reached 74 young people. Um, all of this whilst ensuring that there remains a quality focus on education. Stop. I've got to stop. Sorry. Sorry, folks. Hello, I'm Robert Kogleck. I'm head of corporate parenting in Hackney. Um, and when Nick told, talked about the man from Germany eight months, years ago, who yeah. came into the office, a um, couple of months later, he interviewed me. He was sitting on, a, on the interview panel, and I applied for a role as a social pedagogue in Hackney, which I didn't get, but that's another story. But now I'm head of corporate parenting, so who cares? Um, anyway, what I was asked to uh, talk about is the impact of social pedagogy in our organization and and I thought about um, a lot about the difference between social pedagogy and social work or the similarities between social pedagogy and social work and when I started working in in the UK as a, as a social pedagogue slash social worker I always said there are that's, there's no difference between social work and social pedagogy I mean I worked as a social pedagogue I was 
called myself a social pedagogue in Germany in, a, in, a, in the context of child protection. Um, so I can give you about 20, 30 reasons why it is not, why, why there's no difference. But then I thought actually there's a lot of difference and I can give you another 20 or 30 reasons what the difference is between social pedagogy and social work. Um, but is it important? To, to see the differences, or is it similar? It's a similarities there, and I think it is very important here in the UK now because social pedagogy is just at the beginning of its journey, and I think this is a milestone today, and I'm really happy and very proud to be part of this as well. Um, and I think you and we have achieved so far already around social pedagogy in this country. So I think we're on a on a good way, and we always have to say what is the good thing about social pedagogy, what is the difference. Um, I was. Um, also thinking about um, the approaches that we use um, as a social pedagogue or a social worker. And our main aim is to help people to help themselves. And we all have to be mindful that we should make ourselves redundant. That's our aim, isn't it? Because wouldn't it be great a, a world without social workers, without social pedagogues? We're far from that and we know we're getting not any closer to that at the moment. But I think um, we also need to be mindful that we shouldn't um, see the world through a technocratic or through a um, emotional angle all the time. We should rather see it um, Sorry, I can't read my things anymore. Um, and, and first of all, sorry, first of all, what we need to do is, could you hold it? <laughs> um, we should see the person, the individual in the center and, and the individual all the time. And I think this is what social pedagogy does very well and always teaches us about it, to see the individual first. Um, social pedagogues, I think, um, are very good in translating bureaucracy into functionality and um, and also philanthropy into empathy. And I'm not saying that social workers don't do it, but I think, or looking at our organization and looking at the social workers that are employed in Hackney that actually have a social pedagogue background, those are the ones who challenge us more often around policies. They want to understand the functionality of certain frameworks. That can be a pain. But it's great, I think that's what we need, the pain of people asking all the time, why do we have this and, and, and how can we translate it into practice that it makes sense? And that's something we forget very often in our day-to-day -day context, in our day-to-day -day work. So one example I want to uh, bring up here now, and I'm completely lost with my script, sorry, because I don't know where I am anymore. Um, we changed the way of carrying out looked after children reviews and, um, and I'm not saying it would, wouldn't be a change without social pedagogues but I think the way we, we've done it was influenced through social pedagogy and we have some social pedagogues here who were actually involved in this. Um, which is great. And again, we looked at the functionality. Why do we have to have these reviews? And we did something which is actually quite easy. We put the children back in the center of these reviews and looked into making it purposeful for the children and not about the social workers and using the right tools to make it purposeful for children. So it's quite an easy thing. But um, I think without the social pedagogic thinking, the idea of social pedagogy that was already flourishing in Hackney because we have a lot of social pedagogues there. We were part of the Head, Heart and Hands program. Um, we talk a lot about uh, social pedagogy, especially Nick does a lot, um, which is good, and myself. Um, I think that's what helped us really bringing this together. Another thing is an open space event. We call it an open space event, which is also something we started through the Head, Heart and Hands program. And originally it was for the foster carers and the social worker. Meanwhile, we have children's social worker there, we have our children's counsellor attending, we have our director attending. And the purpose is to sit together, to work together without an agenda, but participants decide what they want to work on, what they want to change. And again, we did something quite simple, which is not a rocket science. We just asked those people who know best, which are the foster carers, which are the people who are working directly with families. So I think social pedagogy might um, has definitely an impact. No? One minute. One minute, thank you. I thought no. Um, it has an impact. Um, but sometimes we don't see it immediately. So it's sometimes the little steps, and I think that's what we need to be aware of. But what is very important is that we have the advocates for social pedagogy in the local authorities, because if you don't have them, it might be even more difficult to, to make the changes. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. And I 
believe all three of you will be around at the end of the event uh, where we're having some drinks to uh, uh, if anybody wants to have a chat or anything. <laughs> thank you, thank you. When I do gigs, I'd like, um, I'd like, uh, would, Becky, would you sit on the, I just want you to take a picture and then tweet it. Is that okay? Do you mind? So, Becky, if you would sit there and then if I'll sit here and then we'll just, as if we were having that conversation. <laughs> tell we're running a little bit late so very quickly uh, I'd like to welcome Pat Petrie and Claire Cameron to the stage to talk about uh, the future of sexual pedagogy. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm only little <laughs> so, but I will sit. Um, <laughs> Well, one or two things. I'm just so pleased to be here. I'm, I'm pleased about that uh, poetry joke, <laughs> which I shall repeat. Thank you. Uh, also, f f one of the first people I met when I came in was introduced to me as having become social worker of the year and social worker team leader of the year. And she happens to be a social pedagogue. So I was just thrilled to bits, I thought. She is in this room. <laughs> what, what a good omen. Some people think never the twain shall meet, but I think they jolly well will. Uh, we've been working on social pedagogy as, as researchers since, well, it's getting over 20 years now. And a lot's happened since then, and we've got a history now. Uh, we've followed up our early first government-funded research, and I think Helen Jones was very instrumental in that, uh, with other international studies looking at social pedagogy in, in different countries and making comparisons with our own services here. And uh, there have been our, our own uh, project, uh, a developmental project looking at employing social pedagogues in residential homes. But there have been many other projects across the country uh, with a sort of demonstration or implementation projects trying to introduce social pedagogy into children's services in, in, in different ways. Um, I've speak briefly about the Head Heart Hands uh, project, which SPA is growing out of directly. I think it's fair to say that. Uh, that the funders of the Head Heart Hands project, which was carried out by a uh, fostering network with uh, the Social Pedagogy Consortium, that is, Thempera, Jacaranda and myself, as delivery partners in that. I think the question at the end of that was, how can we sustain what's happened in this project and how can we take it forward? Well, not quite as difficult as you might think, because over the years, a very strong, influential 
social pedagogy develop network, developmental network has, has evolved. Uh, many sorts of learning opportunities and courses. Um, and a lot of those have focused on residential care, children in residential care or children in foster care, but that hasn't been the end of the story. Uh, amongst work that, that's been going on has been work with disabled adults, with, uh, well, a lively interest from arts and creativity practitioners. Uh, and, and uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've lost my place. It's a case of the, the light again. But in brief, many people and organisations have been cut, become involved with social pedagogy and wanting to take it forward. For some years now, some uh, far-sighted universities have been uh, developing degree courses, uh, both to und undergraduates, for undergraduates and higher degrees. And um, we have our next social pedagogy developmental network that is being hosted by Tunbridge, uh, what is it, the college, West Kent College uh, at Tunbridge. So FE are becoming more involved. Um, I've lost, completely lost my place now. <laughs> I know I'm on page three. So, but the question is, how can social pedagogy grow towards its potential? What can we do to actually m maintain and sustain social pedagogy so that it not only has a history, but it's got a future as well? And that's what SPA is going to be about. With a wide consultation, we uh, developed together, and when I say we, I mean many people in this room actually and beyond. We've developed a charter for social pedagogy, we've developed practice standards, and this year we're launching the, Net the Social Pedagogy Professional Association, or SPA. So we've not only got a history, we've got a future, and we can all be founder members of the association, and I'm certainly going to, <laughs> going to join this year. Uh, and I hope many people in this room will find a way to do that as well. Because social pedagogy, as we've heard from Lem this, this afternoon and, and, and others, it's not just about a procedural approach. Social pedagogy is about an ethic. It's about working with the emotions. It's about theory. It's about practice. And we need an association which will understand those issues as it moves forward to develop in that, sort of, in that sort of atmosphere, the social pedagogic atmosphere. So I'm just so delighted to be here this evening and wishing everybody in the room well on their social pedagogy journey. Falls to me then to, to come down to specifics. What is SPA? What is it, this social pedagogy association that we developed? And we've had a whole year of a project funded by um, KPMG Foundation, Comic Relief, and Esme Fairburn Foundation. And we're now at a point where we think, okay, we're ready to go. We um, are really, it's an organization that's about offering continuous professional development to everybody who's interested in social pedagogy. But it's a two-way thing. We might have some ideas, but so do the members. It's about learning and giving knowledge to each other. So we will provide, SPA as a, as a project, and SPA will become a charity, will provide for members ways and means to get together. It will harness some great resources. And, but members' exchanges, deliberations, their debates, our debates, our documentation of practice, all starting from a shared value base and shared commitments, will help evolve what we think this discipline is for the UK. And we're very clear now that whereas once we thought this is something foreign that exists in continental Europe, 
and this is what we want to emulate, we're now very clear that what we provide and what we generate is our own. We don't have to copy something else. So if you join as a founding member in, in, uh, from now, from 2017, we, have, we will have an annual conference in September. The theme of the conference will be education in its broadest sense. And we really mean that. We mean education in the broadest possible terms, whether that's relating to schools or whether it's relating to learning disability or whether it's relating to what happens with conversations on a walk or, or when you're mending that motorbike. So we'll be looking at the philosophy, the policy, practice of education and social pedagogy and seeing what, what is the overlap, the distinctiveness, are they both the same? Those kinds of questions of teasing out what role, what position could educational philosophy play in helping social pedagogy to articulate itself in a UK context? So that's one big event. Then there'll be some focused learning days, and those are an opportunity to delve deeper into a topic um, just for one day. But that's ideal if you're starting to study at a, at, a, at a higher level or if you're starting a new role and you really need to find out what would it mean to be social... To, to understand questions of ethics in a, in a social pedagogic context in your work setting. So we have one uh, going to be led by Nicola on ethics and a Danish colleague called Soren. Um, and then we've got another one which will be either in Wales or Northern Ireland. And those are two parts of the UK where social pedagogy has not yet been very strong. And we're deliberating what the theme of that day will be but we, it might be, for example, the creative arts and self-expression and social pedagogy and, and how that uh, plays together. So um, we have a programme of webinars as well. We've had one, what is social pedagogy, Pat and I did, and then we're doing it again in a couple of weeks' time. Anyone can, can uh, sign up for that uh, remotely. And then Gabriel Axela will do one on risk and risk competence and what it means to, to understand risk not as a defensive thing but as, a, as something you can embrace and take forward, whether it's allowing children to jump up the stairs or go out, build a fireplace or whatever. So um, we have a website which we're stocking with resources as, as they come up. So all the themes of our, of our events will have resources attached to them on the website. And we're building up a project bank um, for the website so people who are running projects can put a call out for ideas, resources, manpower even, say, you know, I need people who can help me do interviews or whatever, so that we can get an idea of extending this brilliant social pedagogic community into furthering our understanding of how to practice and how to base it further, dig deeper. We also finally uh, want to develop um, communities of practice within the social, pedagogic, um, social Pedagogy Association. So if you are involved in a particular strand of thought and action and you want to find like-minded people, you can post a request to um, join up with others who share your interest and, and take that further as in self-managed groups and we will provide the website space for you to communicate with each other. So, and if anybody here has ideas about topics for those communities of practice and they want to get going, just contact myself and Carla, who's at the back and our project officer, um, and we'll you know, get that going, orchestrate that for you. So the last thing, the very last thing I want to mention before we have our wonderful canapes is the International Journal of Social Pedagogy, um, which has been running for a few years now. It's been adopted into the UCL family of, um, of journals, which gives it extra uh, support and kudos. Uh, we're always looking for new articles based on practice or theory, practice pieces that are not empirically bedded. We can, we can have those too. We had a recent special issue on love in, a professional, in professional practice jointly with um, a journal in Scotland, the residential childcare journal in Scotland. We're waiting to see how that goes down. It's, that was a very long process, two-year process of getting that special issue together. But that will shift the debate massively in the country. So that's what our programme looks like for the year ahead. We'd encourage everybody to join as founding members this year. Um, and then next year, there'll be new membership types. Um, and there will be new events. And so all that remains to be now is to hand over to Helen the 
Thank you, Claire, and I have the unenviable task of keeping you all from the canapes and the drinks, so I promise you that I will be brief. Um, I think it's been a great evening. I think the conversation between Lem and Becky will stay with me for some time to come, and I think particularly the reflections on the importance of others in our own developing sense of self really tunes in to the whole theme of relationships which underpins social pedagogic practice and I think that that was a very, very powerful description that came out of those conversations. I'm the acting uh, current chair of trustees and Amanda is my co-trustees. Uh, we are not operating under executive order and there will be an AGM in September, hopefully, at which trustees will start to be elected. So there will then be real opportunities for wider uh, uh, engagement of people in developing Social Pedagogy Professional Association. Uh, as trustees, we are working towards it being developed as a charitable company limited by guarantee, which means that it's going to be a charity registered with the Charitable Com Charities Commission, but will also have a trading arm which will enable us to apply for grants and uh, undertake kind of wider development activities. Um, you won't be surprised to know that there's quite a lot of... Uh, bureaucracy and things to do to get there, but uh, we are very close to being able to register the company and we think that's going to happen in the next few days. We've just got the last forms to clear. So we just want you to know that we are currently doing a lot to speed things on. Um, as Claire said, we're launching founding membership in the very near future and then future membership will build, will build on and reflect the developing range of qualifications in relation to social pedagogy in the country. Um, as well as holding our first AGM in September, we will also in the autumn be holding our first annual conference and we are currently discussing the themes and topics for that. So that will be something else uh, for you to put in your calendars. Um, we are particularly grateful to the funders of this project, KPMG Foundation, Esme Fairburn and Comic Relief, who were also co-funders of Head Heart Hands, but who were, having already funded Head Heart Hands, were willing to actually engage in an infrastructure project just to enable us to really take and develop social pedagogy into the future. So thank you to all of you, and there are people from those charities here this evening, I know. Um, I'm nearly there. I want to thank Anne Phoenix, who isn't here uh, this evening because she's currently working abroad, but it's thanks to her membership of the British Academy that we've been able to use these illustrious premises this evening, so thank you, Anne, in absentia. Um, you have in your bags a compliment slip which has a question on it which says, what do you see are the benefits to SPA to you and your area of work? And we would really, really like you to uh, give us your response to that and there is a tray for it in the exit because, as Claire said, we really want this to be a two-way process, a real engagement with the community of practice and our membership in terms of being responsive to the growing field and the needs of that growing field in social pedagogy here. So please do that and it will help us. And then I think it probably just remains for me to thank all the speakers for contributing to our launch, to thank you all for coming um, and to encourage you to go off and join SPA and become part of our new membership community. Thank you very much.